Hi, I'm Sebastian from Green Music Productions, and in this video I will show you different tips, quirks, and secrets about Cubase 14. These are things that weren't mentioned in the official new features videos on the Cubase channel. So if you're looking for basic information about the new features, I recommend you to go to the Cubase YouTube channel and watch those videos as they are really well made. This is for advanced users or users that wants to know a bit more about what's been done in Cubase 14. As usual, if you like that kind of content, please click the like button and subscribe if you're not a subscriber. And let me know in the comments below if you like that update. For me, it is a great update, but that's beyond the point. So let's dive right in. I want to first mention that the grace period to upgrade to Cubase 14 if you purchased Cubase 13 started on October 9th. So don't miss out if you purchased Cubase 13 on October 9th or after that, you're eligible for a free upgrade to Cubase 14. Now, the first thing I want to mention is the top bar here. I don't know if you remember, but in the previous version of Cubase, it was white and big, and there was no way to change its color. Now, fortunately in Cubase 14, they made it uniform with the rest of the theme of Cubase. Another thing that they changed but didn't mention is that they did a lot of work under the hood to improve performance. Specifically when loading big projects, when moving a lot of events at once, or dealing with things that are really heavy on the CPU. So it's a lot snappier in those situations. Speaking about performance, if we take a look at the performance monitor, we now have a lot more information. Now I set my sound card to a really, really low buffer to make sure that we would have dropouts. So let's listen to what it sounds like with a low buffer. So as you can see, the performance monitor uh, detected some dropouts. Not only does it tell me where they are, but it also gives me information on how I can solve that issue. So it's telling me that I could freeze this track uh, or I could adjust the ACO buffer, which is the main solution in my situation, or change the ACO card level. Now I want to talk about the modulators. Now this is one of the best feature that they integrated in my humble opinion. Uh, but there are different things that you should probably know about modulators that weren't mentioned. So obviously you can load modulators by going into the lower zone and going under the modulators tab so you can load an LFO. And that LFO will work on everything related to this track. So whether it's inserts, other modulators, uh, the fader even, so uh, the way that we can add it is by uh, clicking on the plus button, but with the learn function, if I select, let's say, the fader, it will affect the fader right away. The other way to load modulators is by, if, let's say, I load an effect, I open the effect, and I can just click on the modulator and add them there. And what I want to mention here is that, let's say, I add a modulator and I add another LFO, it won't be able to affect anything that is outside of the scope of that plugin. So if I try to make it learn the fader on that same track, it won't work. It will be specific to this uh, plugin right here. So in this case, I have a plugin just to show you that doesn't work with the learn function. So which brings me to another tip. If you have plugins that aren't able to learn uh, different knobs, you can always go under select and choose what you would like to affect by the uh, modulator. And the same goes on if, let's say, you would like to add it from the lower zone. Um, I want to add this right here. It doesn't work. I can go under select, choose insert, the insert slot, and then I have all of my controls. Another cool thing, as I mentioned, uh, we can do multiple things like, for example, controlling other modulators with another modulator. So let's say with this macro knob, I want to change the phase. I also want to change uh, the shape. Um, but I want the shape to change fully while uh, the phase I just wanted to move a little bit when I move the knob. As you can see now, as I go up and down, um, the phase is only moving a little and the shape is moving quite a lot. So that's uh, great, but you also have AB settings just like we have on plugins, but it's hidden under that menu right here. 
So if we go to switch to B setting, I can then try something completely different and toggle between the A and the B setting, just like that. I can also apply current settings from A to B. That might be more obvious if we, let's say, uh, go here and choose something completely different, a different shape. Um, we change the phase and the note just to make it obvious. So now if I go back to A, we go back to the original settings. So this is really useful if you're messing around with modulators and you mess something up. You can always switch to different settings or you want to try something completely different. Another thing that the improved performance on is the media bay. Now, obviously we have all the new features over here with time and transpose and things like that. But they also improved on the performance uh, while browsing to the different sounds that you have. So it will be able to load the metadata faster than it used to. And it's more performant now. So it's great to have. And keep in mind that we also have the mini version of the media bay here under media. So usually it will look like that. You just have to go under the file browser. Which brings me to another tip. So they mentioned that with the new function, you can half uh, the speed playback, double it, and do a bunch of things with timing and pitch. Uh, but if you go to the tape machine, one thing that I often do is select a specific range, and that will still work in this situation. Let's say that I want to uh, make it slower. You can always import just a selection with the lower tape machine settings as well, and it will work just as expected. So keep in mind that you can select specific range and this will still be applied. Another thing that they improved on is the video engine and it now supports 4K video file and it works beautifully. I tried different video format. Here I have an 8K video at 60 frames per second and it doesn't want to uh, import it. But I have a 4K video here, and when I import it now, it works beautifully. So let me bring the video window. And it works smoothly without any hiccups. So uh, the improved on the video engine, as usual, you have the full screen mode and all the other options. Another really good thing that they added is a specific folder for autosaves. So uh, it's now under the autosaves folder into your projects folder. And what's really good about it is not only is it not taking space like it used to just right there uh, in your project folder, but it also has a description of the last edits that you've made. So in this case, I added a sampler track here, so I know exactly what edit was uh, made the last, so I know which uh, back file to open. Or let's say here, I changed the size of this track, so it is a lot easier now to know exactly what back file you would want to open. Cubase now also supports DAW project files, so you can import and export DAW project. Uh, this is a really cool file format. It's only supported by a handful of DAWs, but I expect pretty much all DAWs, or the big ones at least, will eventually support DAW projects since it's a lot better than OMF and AAF and you can easily share sessions. It's not perfect, but it, it has a lot more features than AAF and OMF. So it will make a lot of things easier when working with people that are in another DAW. Another small feature that they added, if let's say you did uh, multiple edits on a file and you would like to bounce those so they're only one big file, if you go under audio and you go under bounce selection, we now have a box here saying, please don't ask again if you want to replace the audio file or not. So in my case, when I bounce, I always want to replace the original file. So let's do it. And now every time that I bounce another file, let's try this one, it won't ask me anymore and it will automatically replace the file. They also improved on the range selection tool quite a lot. There's a lot more that you can do now. Just simple things like holding the shift key to expand either the end or the beginning, or if you hold the shift key and do a new selection inside, it will create a new one. 
If you want to resize it, you have to let go of the shift key and grab the handle if you want to make it shorter. But just to, you know, make it longer, it is really nice. Now, let's say I create an event here and I want to select what's in between. I can double click there and move that selection around if I want. But uh, there's also different settings that you have in the preferences regarding the range selection tool. So usually, let's say I want to select a big portion of my project. I do that by holding the shift and control key and then I select a range. Usually if an event was not completely selected, if you move the range selection, it would not cut the events like it just did. It would simply move the events that are completely inside of the range. But they added a selection in the preferences. So if we go under edit preferences, we now have an option here called range tool splits partly selected events. So if I remove that and I try again, you will see that the range selection will move, but no event will move with it. If I, let's say, put that event completely under the range, now it will move it. There's another option that they added, which is, let's say I select this range right here, and I want to remove exactly that range on another track. If I select another track, it will move the range that I have selected. Another example would be, let's say I want to copy this and paste it on another track. I can select another track and paste it there and it's really easy to do. There's also a preference for that if you don't want it to follow the track selection and it's over here. So now if I disable it and I do the same thing, let's say I select this and I select another track, it won't move. So it will stay at the exact event that I selected. One thing that happened, I think it happened in Cubase 13, is let's say you want to stretch an event so you can click on the little down arrow here and uh, click on sizing, applies time stretch, and you can stretch events. So usually, let's say I solo this one and I press play. So it is stretched. Um, one thing that used to happen is if you go under the direct offline processing by pressing F7, you could see the time stretch here and it's not there anymore. So it will use the algorithm specified here, but you won't be able to change the range of the stretch here. Now to make it even more confusing, if you switch that event to musical mode, it will lose the stretch. Now, musical mode over here is not the same as musical mode on the track. I have a video talking about this, so make sure to check out my other videos. But it is a bit confusing now since there's no way for you to see the exact time stretch and change the timing. You have to do it manually by, you know, specifying another range manually like this. Speaking of the direct offline processing, as you know now, the clip gain moved over here at the bottom left of the clips. And we also have an option for clip gains. If you select, let's say, a pencil tool, I can uh, draw dots and freely draw different shapes if I want. But one cool thing is uh, that now the direct offline processing will take into consideration the gain. So. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it can be really frustrating when you have a bunch of things happening in your project and you want to listen to the effects that you're applying in the direct offline processing using the audition over here. And it will be really quiet compared to, let's say, the whole signal chains that you have in your project. Now, if you change the gain, it will be able to play it with the gain that you set. So you can put it to a louder again and it will play louder in your direct offline processing. Another good thing that they added is if you go under edit and preferences, you now have preference presets. So if you're coming from Pro Tools, let's say you have Pro Tools editing, you have the legacy Cubase presets, but also the Cubase 14 defaults. But you also have the same thing for key commands. So if we go under edit key commands, we now also have even more presets. So if you're coming from Ableton Live, Logic Pro, Pro Tools, Sonar, you have 
presets for that that will set all the key commands according to what you have in those DWs. So it will make your life a lot easier if you're trying to migrate to Cubase. Another small thing that they change is uh, you can now have different heights for the lower zone depending on the module that you have selected here. So since they changed the behavior of the mix console tab and you can now see the whole mix console in the lower zone, you will obviously sometimes want to make it higher, but you don't necessarily want the chord pads to be that high in your project or the modulators. So it's really good uh, now because you can specify what height you want for the different modules, change it on the fly, and they won't be reflected in the other modules at the bottom. I see a lot of people complaining about their VST2 plugins not working anymore. Uh, by default, it, they are turned off, uh, but you can go under Studio, VST Plugin Management, and you have the option to enable the VST2 plugins over here. Keep in mind that VST2 don't work with Apple Silicon anymore, so uh, you'll have to get VST3 if you're working on the newer Apple Silicon. Another cool tip is if you have a MIDI track, you can double click with the regular object selection tool and it will create an empty MIDI event that you can start editing right away. So it is really useful if you want to quickly create a new MIDI event. And the same goes for the pattern events. So if I double click here, it just created a new pattern that I can obviously change or edit by double clicking on it. Speaking of patterns, uh, you can now edit the velocity per step, offset probability and all those things, but you can also add your own ones. Now, I'm a little bit sad that it's not possible to add buttons on modulators or on inserts specifically because I really like to work with the electron synths or uh, machines in general because you have an amazing sequencer with parameter lock on effects which means that you can quickly and easily select a note on the sequencer and tweak the effects just for that note but it's possible to do it at least inside of the drum machine itself. So let's say that you would want to change the hold on the amp envelope. You can right click on it and click on pattern editor assigned to step automation. And now let's say that I go back to editing my pattern. It will be here and I can add it in any steps. This is great, but in a future update, I would really love to be able to add those outside of the drum machine knobs, but also from the modulators, inserts, and all that good thing. Now again, let me know if you enjoy that update, and as usual, I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye, guys. Bye.